Okay, <clears throat> hello everyone. So my name is Andreas Krause. I'm a professor of machine learning uh, here at ETH Zurich. And then my role as chair of the new ETH AI Center. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you uh, to our updates event today. It's been now about six months since we kicked off the center in October uh, last year. And a lot has happened over the last uh, couple of months that we'd like to tell you a bit about. Next slide. So for those of you who weren't at the opening, let's just recap briefly about why are we are doing what we are doing. So there's certainly a lot happening in the field of artificial intelligence, and there's been uh, some pretty remarkable improvements, in particular in learning-based approaches uh, towards AI in recent years, really bringing potential to have transformative effects on many fields of scientific inquiry, many sectors of our economy and our society at large. And of course, this is noticed everywhere. There's major national initiatives forming, also new international networks being created. <clears throat> One uh, of them is the European Laboratory for uh, Learning Intelligent Systems, or ELIS for short. Uh, that's a network that has the goal to network the top hotspots of AI research uh, in Europe, and where we are participating as one of the units uh, with our center. Next slide. So why a new AI center at ETH? So certainly there is a lot of research already happening on foundations and methodology of AI, for example, in the area of machine learning, computer vision, natural language processing, data-driven control, uh, and others. And there's also a lot of applications of um, uh, AI techniques to various different scientific uh, disciplines. There's also researchers looking, for example, at societal implications uh, of the technology, questions related to the future of work, and so on. But much of that research has been happening um, in isolation or in sort of in fragmentation across different departments. And that's where we really want to improve at the center, because we believe that some of the most important pressing and also most challenging questions um, that we need to face in order to turn AI into technology that we can all rely on and really trust requires us to work together across the aisle. <clears throat> and so basically, uh, that's what you want to uh, provide room for. Uh, so with the AI Center, we want to provide an environment for engaging in collaborations um, across AI foundations, applications, and Im impact areas of the technology. Next slide. <clears throat> so to that purpose, from the very beginning, we started uh, with the leadership team that represents several different departments at ETH with represent representatives from robotics, uh, data science, embedded systems, also ethical aspects uh, of artificial intelligence. And we were super lucky to get uh, Alex Illich uh, as executive director for our center, who already put in a lot of energy uh, together with his team to uh, successfully kick off the center over the last uh, couple of months. So I'm very happy to hand over to Alex, who will step us through the remaining agenda. Cool. Thank you very much, Andreas. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, time really flies uh, fast. So I'm excited what, what has happened over the last uh, six months and we will share a couple of uh, insights there. Uh, before we jump into the update part, um, I want to use the opportunity to give the stage to three of our faculty members, um, because people are the most important part that are uh, fostering the core of how we, we are shaping the future of AI. And I'm, I'm very excited to have three of the faculty members uh, here with us uh, today that are briefly presenting in five minutes. Uh, who they are and what they're doing. So we have uh, Professor Benjamin Greve, Professor Siu Tang, and Professor Ryan Cotterell, um, who will uh, present themselves very briefly. All right, so can I start, Alex? Yes, go ahead, please. Share my screen. Okay, good. Start my presentation. Can you all see this? That's all right, good. good. And I'll start. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for having me, Alexander. So um, um, I'll just give you a brief introduction of my research group and what I do and um, um, what our basically interdisciplinary or collaborative approach is. My name is Benjamin Gru. I'm a professor at the Institute of Neuroinformatics. And in my group, we have two major goals. Um, through implement, by implementing this interdisciplinary approach. One is to improve AI technology 
And the other one, we're in neuroscience, we also are interested in understanding learning and computation in the brain, right? And I could ask how these, uh, how these things are related. Obviously, uh, one of the big goals one could think about in developing AI technology is at some point, we wanna get to the stage that we have, let's say algorithms technology that gets close to human intelligence, right? That can you know, solve many different problems without being retrained. Um, Good. And in my lab, we have an approach, so we're really half-half. So half the people work in machine learning. In the machine learning, obviously, you have this very abstract concept of here a deep network, right? We just, in principle, care about deep network when I say machine learning. You have neurons, they integrate something, you have weights, you have many explicit, implicit factors, and we don't really know how all these shape learning, right? And, and the performance of the network, right? Think about how much hyperparameter tuning we do um, without really understanding what these networks optimize for, right? And now the idea here is to, to take inspiration from biology from the right side, where we have people doing experiments in, in neuroscience. I'll show you a couple in a second. Um, networks in biology are much more complex. We don't know much about them, right? And now the, the idea here is, can we take something like some, for example, neuromodulators I've wrote here, right? Dopamine, right? We know that in biology, dopamine is crucial for learning. If I kind of blend out your dopamine, you wouldn't learn anything, right? So, can we take this as inspiration, bring it to machine learning and then improve learning in, on the artificial side? Right. Good, and this, we see this as a cycle and that's kind of also how we work in the lab. So for here, we can now today start in, in deep learning, right? And the deep learning part uh, of my lab, we start thinking about challenges in deep learning, for example, the continued learning problem, right? We wanna solve these by developing new types of algorithms. And then these might inspire people from the neuroscience side to think about, well, you know, continued learning is actually is solved by the human brain, but how does it do this, right? Does it, does it use some replay methods, some other algorithm? And then we come up with, with ideas and actually experiments um, to test this. And often this is surprising, right? Things come out, you know, not as we hope for, <laughs> very differently. And then this inspires us again to refine our algorithms or, or make them better. And this is also in line with you know, people at Deep Google DeepMind, many of those uh, know uh, uh, DeepMind, check out this blog post from, from Dr. Nick, who's kind of all about the, the cycle. Good. So now I would like you to give you two examples of what we can do in the lab that, that's very powerful, that's very unique, I believe, right? So we can take this deep network here and, and we can basically take out a, a neuron in the hidden layer, right? Um, that is from biological network, right? We know that in the brain, we have hierarchies, think about our visual system, right? So this is a neuron from a mouse, mouse brain. So we can take it out from the mouse brain, culture it, and then measure it. So here I marked a little electrode that we can somehow stick in and measure um, what's the input output function of this neuron. And much more important, how does it learn, right? How does activity of this neuron relate to, to learning, right? And we know that it's, it's a local update, right? And here's a dish. So this is kind of what, what we work, right? We, you know, we call it patching. We measure this neurons from different side. And why is this so important? So think about how, you know, great decent learning works, right? So obviously you have your cost function at the top and then somehow you break this down using the backpropagation uh, algorithm. And then it locally for the neuron, you have a local update rule, right? That's exactly, I kind of I pulled it out here again. It's your presynaptic activity times your error. Right? And your error is of course backpropagating, right? But is the brain using something like this or maybe it has a much more powerful learning algorithm that we just don't understand yet? This is one question that we investigate now in, in, in the biological setting, right? So with these, uh, beautiful pyramidal cells on the right side. This is actually a, a real neuron from, from, from a mammalian cortex. These are called layer five cells. Um, note that you know 90 or, or 76 to 80% of your brain is cortex, right? So the reason why we are so, so, so probably so intelligent is because we have such a huge cortex. And this is one of the most important cell types that we find in cortex here. Um, and why, right? Um, because we think that this cell type here has the capability of integrating errors, right? That's obviously needed for all types of hierarchical learning, right? So we think that the error comes in on the top, right? These are called dendrites. And because it's spatially distant, it integrates error differently than the bottom part where we have the feed forward signal. And we're onto a couple of cool things where we really think, understand more how biological neurons learn. And I give you a little hint, it's probably not backprop, it's something different. And we hope that you know, investigating this will also lead to a novel view and probably even novel learning or optimization algorithm that maybe, here it comes, right, maybe don't have these problems um, that arise due to great and decent learning, right? Such as you know, when do distributional shifts occur during continual learning, generalization problems, and so on and so on. 
Another route that we go, and then I'm, uh, I'm almost done, is we sometimes start with you know, tackling challenging challenges in the machine learning field, for example, and, and continue learning. Here, we developed a new algorithm that was a meta-learning algorithm, right? So continue as a problem of when you have to, when you want to learn multiple tasks and you have distributional shifts in the data, and we came up with a, a contextual a meta network, a hyper network that basically learns the task or knows the task and then generates right, all the parameters for your task network. And this method was superior to, to many other methods, was on par with replay methods. And now the question is, does the brain does this, right? And um, what we do is here, um, we go to continual learning and we test it in mice. And here on the right, you see a setting where we have a mouse and this little box here. And it can, you know, sees images on these little touch screens and then can touch it. You can think of it as mouse amnest, right? Um, so the mouse learns, you know, to distinguish different images. This is shown here in the middle. And when it gets the right images and touches the right touch screen, then it gets a little reward. And then we, you know, train it on different sets of images. We look, does it forward generalize? And does it actually, you know, is it able to go back to task number one? So is it capable of continue learning? Um, and um, this, we have some very promising results that mice can actually do this, which is which is super cool. And we hope to get new insights, right? Uh, and the idea here also that mice learn a, a two network system that somehow our prefrontal cortex or the mouse prefrontal cortex knows the context, it knows the task and primes the visual cortex, right? The, inf the, the, the image processing network for the task to create or implement the right mapping from images to, to output behavior. All right, that was it from my side. Um, I hope that you know very soon we can go back to normal working, uh, working in the cup office or in the address room, and then I would be excited to you know meet all of you and discuss with you. All right, thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Next up would be Siu Tang. Yes. Can you see my screen now? Looks good. Yeah. yeah looks good. Very good. Uh, yeah, okay, good. Hello everyone, I'm Si Yu. I joined ETH last year leading the computer vision and learning group at the computer science department. I'm very glad to be here to talk about capture and synthesis of 3D humans. So the research in my group focused on two themes. The first one is to perceive and understand 3D humans in images and videos. Given these interesting images, we want to understand what are these people doing, how do they perform different tasks? How do they interact with the world and each other? The second focus is to generate realistic virtual humans interacting realistically with the 3D world. We hope eventually by observing real humans, we can create digital humans that behaves like real ones. So in the next, I will show three research highlights. So the first project I want to show here is a new generative model of human body and poses. Here, uh, all these bodies are represented by our model. So understanding humans from images and videos are very challenging. Uh, therefore, a good generative model or prior human body is very important. Because it is important, human body model have been studied in computer graphics and computer vision for a long time. But most of them are mesh-based representation. So uh, meaning representing volume to test interpenetration with the environment is, uh, is not trivial. So in this work, we propose to learn neural occupancy representations to express the body shape deformations for highly articulate poses. Such neural occupancy representation is very useful for modeling 3D humans interacting with object environment where we need efficient and a differentiable occupancy check. The second line of work I want to show here is motion pre prediction and generation. So a key step towards understanding human behaviors is to predict 3D human motion. So in this CVPR work, the goal is to predict a diverse set of plausible motions in the near future, given the past motion of a person. And the result is on the left side. Um, on, in the left video. So for people who work on this motion prediction area knows that most previous work only use skeleton to represent human body and only show skeleton motion prediction. However, as time progresses, the skeleton can become less and less in proportion so that in the end, the skeleton rarely corresponds to a valid human body. So people also use surface-based human body models by predicting joint rotations of human body but they often don't include the global trajectory because combining the global trajectory and the local pose is very hard. 
So in this work, as shown on the left video, we predict global realistic full body motion and largely improves the realism and quality of learning based motion prediction results. And on the, uh, on the right side is a result of extension of the CBPR work. So now instead of generating just like predicting just a few seconds, as most people do, now with our model, we can predict. So, so we call it perpetual motion. So it is, it is an autoregressive model with uh, and learn from large scale motion capture data. I think the result is very exciting, at least to me. And I think it's fine to watch this never stopping motion of this virtual human. The last highlight I want to show here is about uh, hand object interaction. So robotics grasping of household object has uh, made a, a good progress in recent years. However, human grasps are still difficult to synthesize realistically, but here are the result of our model. So in this, in this work, we propose a new representation for human grasp, grasps modeling, and we parameterize it, uh, parameterize it with deep neural network and learn it from data. As shown here, the proposed grasping field representation is efficient as expressive for human grasps generation given various 3D objects. So there are also several other exciting research pro projects that are, that are happening in my group including 3D human clothes modeling with, uh, with uh, point cloud, uh, generating 3D humans realistically in the 3D environment, and 3D human body uh, estimation from sparse point cloud, and joint surface and reconstruction uh, 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 and appearance reconstruction for 3D environment from RGBD sequence uh, in a self-supervised way as well as a skeleton driven neural implicit hand models and also whole body grasping generation. So please feel free to contact me if you are interested in knowing more about this project. Uh, that's all from my side, thank you very much. Perfect, thank you very much, very impressive. Uh, next up would be Ryan Cottero. I think you're muted, Ryan. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, now it works. Hi, I'm Ryan. Um, uh, can you guys see the slides? Looks good. Great. Um, so you can check out what we're up to at our website, which is uh, ricolab.io. It was a pun on Ricola. Uh, and we had a very Rico like logo to the lawyers made us change it. So now there's just mountains. But anyway, you can see all the fun stuff we're up to. I was hired about a year ago to work on NLP. Uh, so I was one of the first NLP fires at ETH along with my colleague Rin Maya. Um, and I'm going to talk about one specific project uh, I'm interested in because I've never really been particularly good at summarizing more than one thing in a slideshow. But uh, the website sort of lists most of our recent work. Okay. Um, so to overview machine learning in a picture, uh, the standard sort of machine learning pipeline largely looks like this. Um, we have some data uh, from feature extraction and then we put it through a model to get predictions. Um, so more or less we have data in, uh, data out. Um, but uh, a common sort of feeling among various people in, 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 in machine learning is that, you know, the data are the real world and uh, the real world is sort of the, the way it, it is. And the machine learning uh, scientist, it's not the machine learning scientist's problem to sort of make sure the model makes fair and equitable predictions. Um, okay. So I'd first like to sort of disabuse the, the listeners of the idea that the data represent the world. So I'll start with a relatively simple qu uh, question, which would be what color is a banana? So most people would say, oh, I think a banana is yellow, right? Um, but if you look at the data, um, what you'd find is that uh, if you, you look for the bigram green bana uh, banana versus yellow uh, banana on Google n-grams, you'd find that you know, green bananas are a bit more common. And the reason for this is actually because we don't tend to talk about yellow bananas because we assume they're yellow. So the data, um, isn't the way humans talk about the world isn't really the way it is. Um, so it's, it's actually quite telling, you know, completely devoid of any ethical issues that most NLP systems tend to think bananas are green. Um, but um, 
and this this sort of bias has other issues uh, or creates other issues, specifically with respect to to gender. You could see um, if you looked at um, Google engrams to say whether you have male doctors or female doctors are more common, you would see that male doctors are a lot more common. And this also does not reflect the world because at least in the United States, about 50% of medical doctors tend to be women. But we talk about male doctors more often than female doctors. And this is, um, uh, you know, this, this you can see the gap sort of uh, closing, but it, it's still a problem. Um, so that's sort of the problem one, which is that the data don't really represent the world. But even so, uh, there's many really nasty things out there that you probably don't want to train your large scale NLP models on anyway. So even if the data does represent the real world, so there are people that say mean things, uh, we probably don't want to use that data anyway. Okay. Um, so now I want to move towards, towards the topic of the talk, which is gender bias in morphologically rich languages. So there's an unfortunate situation where almost all work on bias in natural language processing has focused on English. And you know, English is, is not the only language in the world. Um, so if we look at a, 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 uh, a gendered language like Spanish, where the word for engineer and uh, female engineer, so it's ingeniero and ingeniera are, are morphologically distinct, we see that the problem is actually exacerbated because masculine tends to be the default. So it's not really true that in any Spanish speaking country, there are a hundred times more male engineers than Spanish, speak, Spanish speaking uh, uh, than in female engineers. Um, so this is an example of, of erasure bias. Um, and moreover, uh, issue data problems like this sort of reinforce existing societal biases. Okay. Um, and moreover, this, this goes both ways. If you looked at the word for nurse, you'd see the same problem with, with traditional female roles. Okay. Um, so a problem I'm really interested in uh, is um, looking at gender bias in morphologically rich languages. So an interesting test case for this is the Turkish language. So famously, Turkish lacks grammatical gender. This means there's no word for he and she. There's just one word for the third person. Um, so the idea is if we plug this into Google Translate, uh, you could see something, uh, you know, you could take a Turkish sentence like ubir a guzul professor, which would mean um, he or she is a beautiful professor. Um, and we have a contrasting example where we say he or she is an intelligent professor. And if we plug this in, um, the, the output, if we plug this in a translation from, from Turkish to English, the output will be gendered. Um, so this sort of shows that, you know, the only, um, the only reason the, the model thinks that this should be a he as opposed to a she is, is due to bias in the underlying uh, NLP model. Um, but again, these, this, this sort of problem affects most NLP systems, even beyond uh, machine translation. It's just very easy to see this in the case of Turkish. Um, okay, um, so Google Translate has tried to fix this recently. Uh, so they offer now a choice um, uh, of translation. So you input a Turkish sentence and it, it outputs either she is a doctor or he is a doctor. Uh, and the, the user gets the choice. So you know that it's all in the user's hands and this seems to work well for English. So the question that I had asked uh, scientifically was what happens if we try it out for Turkish to German? Um, so if you, this was, uh, so these were actual translations of about a year ago or so, so they might've changed. But if you, if you plug in Ubir uh, Guzul Doktor, so she's, he or she is a beautiful doctor into Google Translate, out will come Sie ist deine schöne Ärztin, which is gendered for those who, who speak German. Uh, and if you look at the suggested translations, it's actually not faithful. It replaces beautiful with nice. Okay, um, so this is sort of the state of, of the ability to do any sort of gender debiasing work or bias mitigation work in, in a morphologically rich language, or at least in terms of actual deployed technologies. Um, and if you, you, you tried the other sentence we talked about earlier, uh, he or she is an intelligent doctor, uh, you get back a masculine translation with no suggested alternatives. Um, so to sort of wrap up, I want to talk about why this is a particular problem for German. Uh, so this has to do primarily with uh, the fact that you have to change more than one word. You can't just change the pronoun. The noun has to go from Ots to Ärztin and you have to change the article and the adjective. So the approach we had come up with was a post hoc editing approach where this idea is that we take a Turkish sentence. Uh, again, this machine translation here is primarily done for um, explanatory purposes. This, this holds for really NLP, any NLP model. Um, we have this gender neutral pronoun we get back a German uh, translation and we identify the word we wish to change. Um, and then we sort of perform this sort of uh, morphosyntactic surgery on uh, the sentence to get back um, 
to get back a, 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 an, a sentence that's properly grammatical, but where the, uh, the gender professor has changed. Um, so we have quite a few projects in this area. Some are published, some are under peer review. And the larger point is that when we talk about bias in language and how to fix it, many of the solutions, when you get down to the technical details, focus on English or exploit grammatical properties of English, like the fact that professor can refer to someone of either gender in English. That's not true in many languages, specifically the languages of Switzerland and Europe, uh, which often have uh, rich morphology. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Ryan, uh, for, for the, sharing these, these great uh, insights. Um, so let me jump back to the, to the program. So um, after giving you like a few impressions from just uh, three faculty members um, of the ETH AI Center, you already see that some of the, these problems are, are highly uh, uh, in, uh, interdisciplinary and uh, really need uh, collaboration uh, between the different groups. So before giving an update on, on what, what we have uh, done in the last six months, I wanna start uh, with the, the uh, first thing with the team. So we have expanded a little bit also our team in, in the back. So basically now the team supporting the AI Center as executive uh, office is uh, uh, consisting of four people. So I'm very happy to have uh, Viviana, Klaus and Natalia on board. Um, and you see also that we are, we are a very efficient, very lean team. Um, uh, but the team also brings in a lot of experience from, from various fields. Viviana uh, worked, worked in a leadership position in a startup and, and comes from the startup in innovation area. Klaus has co-founded the ETH uh, Entrepreneur Club and has worked with many companies in the past. Natalia brings in a lot of experience from ETH in, in other places. So um, what, what do we wanna accomplish with the ETH AI Center? So, uh, ETH has been doing uh, decades on, on, of research on AI and is very successful in the research part. So we, we believe that in order to, to make a positive impact on the, on the world, we need to show the, the, the way towards trustworthy, accessible and inclusive uh, AI systems for the benefit of society. And in order to achieve this, we need to approach it with an interdisciplinary approach and we need to start breaking up silos and bringing people together. So this is why we're ETH central hub for artificial intelligence. And we have basically five uh, distinct principle which, uh, principles which set, sets us apart from many other places. So uh, at, the, at the first forefront is really the co-evolution of AI foundations and AI impact areas. Because we believe in order to make significant breakthroughs and to achieve our vision, we need to do research on foundations, applications and AI implications at eye level with a mutual respect, but also mutual influence of each other in order to solve the problem. Um, we also uh, believe in serendipity. So we wanna uh, foster this by co-locating uh, the different disciplines at a dedicated physical center. So we have almost 1000 square meters as new space for the ETH AI center where we can bring together people, uh, which obviously will be much more important post COVID but it's an important element of our culture that we believe that people also need to be willing to bring their, their physical body to another place in order to be open and, 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 and collaborative. So the focus is on interdisciplinary and serendipitous collaboration. So things that we did not plan and anticipate before, um, which is very important in, in, in the culture of, of, of trying new things and pushing forward breakthroughs. We also wanna um, manifest this in several ways. And one of the programs um, that we push very strongly, which is our flagship program, which we launched uh, when we launched the ETH AI Center is, uh, a uh, is the fellowship program. So the ETH AI Center fellows are very selected people that are bridge builders that are already recruited in an interdisciplinary way to, to cross different disciplines, different fields, different departments, uh, or uh, uh, different boundaries that have not been crossed in that way before. And last but not least is we see it as our uh, mission to basically bring the research into industry and, and startups. So to make an impact on the, on the economy and, and society because AI is influencing all of the uh, different parts of our society and industry. And we have a huge opportunity that we can leverage with a Swiss way of approaching AI. So in terms of numbers and people, we've grown quite a lot. So we started with 29 professors 
we have now over 88 professors covering all 16 departments of ETH from, from architecture to mathematics to social sciences. So it's truly impressive uh, who we uh, uh, co convinced to bring on board and who is committed to the vision and mission of, of, of the center. So in addition to the professors, there are of course a number of people connected to it. So, so over 200 postdocs, over 1,400 PhD students. So it's one of the largest AI centers in, in the world. And it has, as I mentioned before, a particular focus on interdisciplinary uh, AI. How we approach this, uh, this is by structuring the world a little bit in impact areas. So for us, it's important that we have the AI foundations, which are very strong, but that we're not only doing the one side of applying this uh, to, to different fields that are relevant society, but also looking at the other way back. So what do we need in order to tackle, for instance, certain problems in the medical uh, area? Maybe we need new foundations uh, of, of uh, uh, um, systems that can learn faster and generalize better with less data or that are more robust. So this is something where we see our USP uh, emerging. And this is exactly what we used as a launch pad for our uh, first uh, fellowship program. So over the course of the next three to five years, we want to bring each year around uh, 10 to 15 new fellows on board that are specifically recruited at topics that are uh, building these bridges. Um, we started the call with opening this center and we got a lot of feedback. So overall, we had almost 400 uh, uh, applications that passed the first screening test, which, which is really great. And also the process was very interesting because you can imagine suddenly you have professors involved from a, a number of different domains, which are also maybe judging certain criteria differently. So we, we embarked on this, this process, which was actually um, uh, running quite, quite nicely of first of all screening of course who would would fit with our criteria of not not only being uh, excellent on a, a scientific point of view but also being able to bring in this value of community and interdisciplinarity and as one of the key elements in this process was that there was a matchmaking step in there where basically two faculty members needed to raise their hand in order to be able to shortlist different people so only if you have basically the bridging of the domains that you say, let's bring in a PhD student to actually cross the boundaries in AI and health, right? Then the two professors uh, from different uh, areas basically enabled this. So from this process, we invited 32 um, uh, candidates to a symposium, which this time, unfortunately, we had to do, do online, uh, but we had, um, we had around 140 uh, interviews uh, there. And out of this, we selected um, 17 fellows that met the criteria and, and uh, which are in our uh, vision also embodying the spirit uh, of spearheading this new field. So um, it's, it's great to see that already in the first six months, we were able to attract uh, that uh, top talent and uh, also to make that impact. And also to mention it, this is a yearly process. So we continuously shaping this by bringing in new people that are embody this vision. So the next call uh, for uh, will be open in September this year um, for 2022. And we currently also finishing up a call for postdocs. And usually like for postdocs, we try to bring in around five to eight people uh, a year. So that basically we have also a different seniority level, um, uh, new talent that we can uh, bring with our spirit. To give an impression about the people, so we're, we're super thrilled basically that we were not able to get really the best talents, but also a very diverse crowd from, from various backgrounds, uh, uh, from 50% from male, 50% female talents as, as well, uh, and that every one of them has two mentors. And uh, they often, the mentors are from different departments, even uh, at ETH. So we had over eight departments represented in, in, in this uh, round here uh, and, and also forging new, uh, new topic uh, barriers and collaborations that have not existed before. So they will gradually start, like the majority of them will start in, in, in September, but I'm very, uh, very happy that we have basically now the first cohort to, to bring on board. In addition to the fellows, um, we also made significant progress on the industry collaboration. And for this, I want to hand over to, to Klaus. Thank you very much, Alex. 
Yes, uh, it's very important to us to work together with industry and uh, it's one of our core, core missions to engage with uh, the Swiss and European companies at hand that work on AI uh, and therefore we collaborate with many of them. Um, it's important because new findings in theory have implications for AI in practice and vice versa and that's why this co collaboration is so important. Um, we offer companies mainly three three um, aspects and, and, and they're centered around talent, right? We help companies find talent in the AI domain. Um, of course, that's, that's uh, mainly students and, and, and postdocs, um, starting with thesis projects and, and internships um, and hopefully also helping them to, to start working uh, in a permanent situation then down the road. And um, to facilitate um, innovation, um, we, um, we conduct uh, research collaborations with uh, our industry partners. Um, of course, ETH uh, wants, wants to work on novel topics. We want to publish new findings. And for companies, we help them to um, be on the cutting edge of AI. And um, yeah, we do this by a small scale projects and, and, and large scale projects. Um, for example, InnoSwiss projects uh, are a keyword here um, and, and uh, allow companies to, to collaborate with ETH here. In that aspect and finally we are building up a community um, today uh, we have had over 400 signups for this event and this shows how large uh, the Swiss AI community already is and we want to connect uh, you to our to the center and companies uh, to researchers building the bridge also to startups and this is why uh, we are uh, building this AI community here at the center and um, yeah, we want you to be part of that. Um, some examples of what we already achieved in the first half year is of course, we have signed up the first corporate partners. Um, we've also um, built together four quite large um, research projects with large consortiums, such as the one you see on the bottom right uh, on the project of augmented reality glasses. Um, the goal here to build a hardware set um, mixed reality glasses um, and, and the ecosystem around it. Um, we are working on personalized training and therapies also using mixed reality uh, there as a key innovation. We have um, set up a research project on digital health and more specifically on medical devices and digital twins of those. Um, and we have submitted um, an Inner Swiss uh, flagship project uh, on Earth observation data for sustainability, meaning we plan to use satellite data to uh, measure, but also simulate the state of the planet in terms of uh, yeah, weather, climate changes, but also human behavior data to uh, measure and simulate uh, our planet and understand certain impacts much better than before. We work with small startups and, and large tech companies, as you can see on the bottom right, we really look for um, collaborations with partners in the AI domain. And um, if you want to be working with us on, on um, innovative topics, such as the ones that I just mentioned, please reach out to me and we look forward to working with you. Good, thank you very much, Klaus. Um, in addition to working with the industry partners, entrepreneurship is a, a key topic. And for this, I want to hand over to Viviana. Hi, super. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Alex. Um, yeah, like Alex said, uh, entrepreneurship is, uh, is also very important uh, to us. Uh, we believe fostering entrepreneurship is crucial because AI, um, you know, enables so many great changes. And we believe that startups really um, could be, you know, drivers in um, in some of the biggest transformations uh, that are about, about to come. So, um, how do we foster entrepreneurship? Um, of course, we um, want to support the visibility of the AI center in the startup ecosystem. So, um, we have keynotes, we have talks. For example, um, a couple of weeks ago, we spoke at, at the Start Summit. Um, but we also want to support networking between, um, obviously, also industry, but also startups and and research. Um, which we do, for example, at our faculty meetings, um, where we uh, invite selected uh, startups to present really what they're doing also in the impact areas. Um, on top of that, we also want to uh, contribute to like the larger um, startup ecosystem um, and always try to bridge the gaps um, beyond the AI center as well. Um, and we uh, work very closely with other important uh, ecosystem players in the Swiss uh, startup ecosystem, um, such as, for example, Gebert Ruf uh, Foundation, uh, Botna, uh, Foundation Botna, um, 
the student project house, ETH transfer, um, and and other uh, others. So. Yeah, um, one of the other very, very important goals for us is that we really want to make sure um, that we open up the entrepreneurial uh, career path um, for researchers, for faculty, for students. Um, and uh, we uh, are at the moment uh, piloting um, a, a new program. Um, we're a lead partner in this, um, but we also uh, collaborate with uh, HSG and other universities on this um, to really create a strong um, cross university collaboration. And uh, in that program, we really want to help students uh, form interdisciplinary diverse uh, teams um, during their studies and help them kind of make the first steps uh, towards their entrepreneurial journey. And of course, we're also always uh, super, super happy to see startups um, coming out of the um, center, especially um, when there are several different faculty members involved. Um, and in January, the uh, ETH spin-off report was, uh, was published, and we can already see that um, the ETH is kind of a hotbed for AI startups, and we're very, very proud that um, also uh, yeah, two of the AI center startups uh, we can, are amongst them. And, um, yeah, I would really quickly like to, to highlight those two. Um, one of them is uh, Deep Judge, uh, a legal tech startup with the involvement of Professor Thomas Hoffman and Professor Elliot Ash. So also in that startup, we have um, different faculty members uh, involved. Um, and the other um, startup as well, Lattice Flow, um, uh, which is a startup uh, on robust AI um, with Professor Andreas Krause and Professor Martin uh, Vetchev. So yeah, this has been a, a really amazing start, and um, uh, as we, we really believe it's important to bring the technologies from ETH also out in the world, uh, we are very much looking forward to also see um, and support a lot more of uh, those examples in the future. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much, Vivi. Um, so uh, in the next part, I want to highlight uh, a, a few topics that are that are important for us and also a few partnerships and, and, and people. So I'm, I'm delighted to have uh, have uh, uh, people there from the AI ecosystem uh, around ethical AI diversity and entrepreneurship. Um, so these are topics that are, are close to, to our heart and we also value quite a lot the collaboration. First, first up would be Dalit Steiger. Next uh, would be then Stefan German, then Melanie Gabriel, and last but not least, uh, Sasha Stocker. So I hand over to you, Dalit. So thanks a lot for being here and looking forward to, to your impulse. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me and the Swiss Cognitive with you, with you guys. And we're very proud to have such a great center, AI center in Switzerland. And you just mentioned it before, uh, how you describe what you guys are doing, lead the way towards trustworthy, accessible and inclusive AI for the benefit of society. And this is such an important and core thing. What we do from the Swiss Cognitive perspective is we are a network that shares, connects and unlocks the potential of AI. And this is exactly what we need, this global collaboration on one hand, but very important within Switzerland. And there, I would really like to share my slides with you. What you ask me when we discussed is why now that we should talk about, hold on a second, I'm just trying to share my screen. Sorry. Okay, so why, why now and why is it so important, especially for Switzerland and for us, it's very important always to say, we have to shape instead of being shaped. And when we look, somehow my keyboard doesn't work. This is exactly what I was saying, you know, we're talking about robots gonna take over the globe and the basic infrastructure doesn't work. Okay, so I just want to give you a little bit about what Swiss Cognitive is. We are a startup. We started in 2016, built up a very strong AI community globally, reaching out today to over half a million followers on social media who are AI enthusiasts as experts and uh, multinational companies and startups, all with a 
with the aim to unlock the potential of AI for the benefit of the human being. We're working together with over 450 companies, not only in Switzerland, and reaching out in the meantime to 88 countries. Now, we don't have to talk about why AI, it's another tectonic shift, but what is really important, why so important to Switzerland, and this is what we did out of Schweiz, and you guys all mentioned it already. I mean, one of the assets that we have, we need also to talk about them. It's not only that we're doing great stuff, the world really needs to, to see this. And we've heard it before, we are one of the top global hubs in different matters. And ETH definitely belongs to the very top universities that we have. So we have to show the globe what we can and for that it's always very interesting to see so what are our swiss assets ai is a technology that goes cross industry cross commodity and cross technology and this is exactly what we can build up in switzerland we have already all these assets but we have to bring them towards the society we have to talk about them we have to give them visibility and for Switzerland, it was always very important. We don't have gold, we don't have any natural resources. Actually, the only natural resource we have is be between our ears is the brain. We do have a lot of brain assets. I mean, this is one of the things that we see with ETH. So we have to use us. We have to use technology to be able to build up the next step for a trustworthy and a sustainable welfare for the next generation to come. We are a country from almost 100% small and mid-sized companies, and we were talking about 90.7% of them. They're having about 70% of all employees, but from a GDP perspective, we're covering only half. And if we're looking at the expert, it's even not a fifth. So there, obviously, we do have a great, great perspective how we can leverage that. And we have to be competitive in a global market. And Switzerland definitely has the possibility to scale up, to do their services and products smart. Because only with GDP, increasing, uh, only with exports, sorry, we can increase our GDP. And we do have the power. We do have the possibilities. And we actually do have the talents. And one of the things that we're always talking about, all these um, different rankings, and you mentioned it before also, some of the rankings. Now, first of all, we need to know what rankings are important to us, important to really attract the talents, attract headquarters of companies, attract companies to build up the research centers in Switzerland. And we went and looked at the numbers and we saw where we have definitely a very easy possibility to increase these numbers. And I'll be happy to share those slides. So I'm not gonna go through these different numbers now with you. We do have one of the best infrastructures in Switzerland, so we have to use it. And one of the things that we know to attract talents is there are also people who earn good money. People who come to such a country like Switzerland, they come not only because of the infrastructure and the possibilities, also because they would like to raise up their kids in a safe environment. They're really happy to be able that, um, to leave their kids to go to school by the moment. So we do have so many assets to give to talents, to companies who are bringing their employees to Switzerland that we really need to make sure that we are on the top of the technology, research, development, implementation, and so on and so forth. Another very important thing that unfortunately we are not talking enough about it is about the whole policy making, about the UN, the ITU, the World Economic Forum. We have them all in Switzerland. This is because of the trust that the globe has into Switzerland. So for us, it's very important, and this is why we're so happy to have ETH, EPFL, and all the others here in Switzerland, and especially now the AI center that you're building up. We have to break the leaves. We have to make sure that we not just adapt 
that we not just try to be more efficient, more effective. We really have to build new businesses. And therefore, we need a commitment in our country, not only on a university level, not only on research and not only on companies level, it's a commitment that we need from the society. And therefore we need to do a lot of awareness campaigning and to make sure that we are talking about the real stuff, no magic, no terminators and how AI and the technology can support the human being, enhance our capability and make the better world. So how AI can change make Switzerland big. Our aim is with you together, make sure that Switzerland is gonna to belong to the top five AI centers globally, be competitive with the big ones. And this is a picture that has been taken at the hub in Switzerland, just read it carefully. And here we see speed is everything. So we shouldn't miss the train. So why wait, act now and share for success we will do everything what we can to ensure that there will be visibility to bring your project and your achievements out to the globe through our stages and whatever we can support. Thanks. Cool. Thank you very much, Dalit, for this very, uh, very inspiring speech. Um, next up would be Stefan German, who's uh, CEO of Fondation Botner. Thank you very much. Um, Alex, and I would like to thank the organizers to convene this excellent event. And I would like to start with a few reflections. I mean, why does ETH exist? You know, why do we do this exciting research? Why do we have this innovation pipeline? I mean, it was exciting to hear from faculty about deep learning and neuro, neuroscience on 3D motions uh, of humans. And I think in that excitement, we sometimes forget the deeper why. And that's why it's so exciting for us that the AI Center has a very clear focus of bringing benefits for society. Because in the end of the day, isn't it that all these efforts, it's not about publishing more papers, which is very important, but it's actually about making a difference in terms of a more sustainable, better society where individual and collective well being of ourselves, of others, and nature actually is taking place. And so, as a foundation, Fonasio Botnar is deeply committed to leveraging AI and digital technologies for the well being of young people with a strong focus on low and middle income countries. We believe that it's essential that we not only look at AI for public good, but we actually look at good AI for the public good. So whilst this session is titled Ethical AI, I must disappoint you if you expected a deep ethical lecture at the end of a day. I'm a practitioner more on human rights and technological interfaces. So I'm focusing my short input more on issues around trustworthy IE that Professor Krause introduced at the beginning and where this center has an important role to play, but as well looking at the role of human rights within AI solutions from a research to a deployment perspective. So we have the privilege of supporting a number of uh, AI-based projects around the world. And I would just like to give two examples. One is the dynamic project, which is supported by researchers from Unisante and Lausanne and EPFL that's currently being implemented in East Africa. It is an approach where machine learning uses all different types of data from weather data to fever diagnostics on a particular child to determine whether a fever is a pneumonia, is malaria, or is something else. And this is very hands-on practical. These are community health workers, very sort of appropriate local technologies, but with that sort of supportive backend, getting a much better prediction in terms of actually the diagnostics related to fever, which still has tremendous implications as many, many children are die 
because of wrong diagnostics of fever in low and middle income settings. Plus we have demonstrated through that the significant reduction in the prescription of antibiotics, which I would recall in the context of our current global pandemic of COVID, which is you know, really serious, but there is much more serious issues waiting in terms of antimicrobial resistance. And so issues around antibiotic prescription and reductions is very significant to contribute to that future potential health threat. So another example is uh, what's happening in Geneva right now, and ETH Zurich is and EPFL are engaged in this new effort is called the IDAR, the International AI for Health Research Collaborative, which is the idea to launch in about a year or two, a bit like a CERN that was established years ago for nuclear sort of uh, physics collective collaborative uh, research to do that on the AI for health sort of space on a global research effort to bring the best brains together to tackle some of the most pressing global health needs that can be resolved through AI solutions. So these are just two examples of our investments. I would like to draw just very briefly on a number of key issues. First of all, if we have ungoverned and unregulated AI solutions, there is as well potential to do a lot of harm. It's quite concerning to see how some of the big tech companies together with government are actually starting to deploy AI solutions in the public spaces that actually are undermining significantly the human rights of us as individuals. So we need to ensure that highly sensitive personal data, which is often the core of these applications, that this must be protected against exploitation, theft or misuse. So we need to ensure that the, the private sector's ethic codes, that they're really up, up to standard. And we feel very strongly, and we are starting a collaboration with Amnesty International, their Amnesty Tech team, that we need to have human rights impact assessment of these tools from the beginning when they are conceptualized at the R&D stage, innovation, deployment, right through the life cycle of these technologies. The second one is, and I'll take the uh, health example, is that we quite often focus too singularly at specific problems without giving consideration on the bigger systemic pictures. We see that quite often in health, that applications are sort of not considering the societal, economic, political, or sort of health systems uh, considerations. We don't consider for example, how does it impact workflows of individual people? A good example is the recent Swiss COVID app, which we have partly supported with a grant with EPFL, but that looks more on the global sort of for the for low and middle income countries. That great technology, but little consideration were given on the political, sociological, or you know, emotional factors around these technologies. So ultimately, we need to recognize that science and technology are not neutral or value-free. They are very closely interlinked with social, political, cultural, and the economic order in which they evolve. And that's where I think Dalit from uh, Cognitive Switzerland has really given the good example how strong Switzerland is positioned because of our sort of broader societal system that is sort of enshrining some of the basic human rights into our daily lives. And therefore as well, we can bring that into AI, these ethical and human rights issues. There are many good resources. Just one example is called the ethical stack, which the London School of Economics and the Copenhagen Institute of Interaction Design, CIDD, has sort of developed. It's worth looking at that ethical stack on their website and use their tools. I would like to conclude with uh, Fritsch of Capra, who recently wrote the book on the system's view of life. Each living system is an integrated whole whose essential properties cannot be reduced to those of its part. They arise from the interaction and relationships between the parts. And I think we need as sort of top researchers at, at ETH Zurich really to take a system's view of life in all that you're doing. 
So the center seeks to foster excellent research, innovation with industry, entrepreneurship and trustworthy and accessible inclusive AS system. I believe strongly that the next generation of AI leaders that comes out of ETH Zurich and supported by the AI Center, that they should take the human rights approach as their guiding North Star and embrace a holistic systems view of life as your leadership ambition. And I'd like to conclude with three questions. Ask yourself, who are you as a new AI leader? Where are you in creating through AI sustainable well being of our society and the planet? And finally, what will be your legacy? Thank you so much for your attention. Cool. Thank you very much, Stefan, for, for this great uh, impulse and uh, great exercise for also for us to reflect on the last uh, three questions. Appreciate it very much. Uh, next up would be Melanie Gabriel. She's a, a successful entrepreneur, uh, and she's also very passionate about the topic of diversity as a board member of, of WeShare Tech, and I'm very excited to have her, her here today. Thank you very much. You can see my slide, correct? Uh, it just uh, started screen sharing. I don't see the slides yet. I will try again because it was paused. Can you see it now? No, cannot see, it, see them yet. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. Um, I, I don't really need to slide. So um, I'm glad to be here. I'm, I'm Melanie Gabriel, the co-founder and CMO of uh, Fiocoi. That's a Swiss fintech startup that uses AI to fully automate the expense and credit card um, processes of mid-size and big enterprise. And besides being an advisor at the Talent Cave program of the ETH AI Center, I'm also a board member at WeShare Tech that uh, Alexander just said. WeShare Tech is a network that is uh, dedicated to greater diversity and inclusion in, in tech and innovation. And so the question is probably also, why is diversity still such a, a debated topic? We have heard that so many times, um, diversity is everywhere. And it helps when we look around and look at the numbers, because it is still a sad fact that in the top leadership positions, uh, there are still very few women. And if we say that we haven't even started to talk about other traditionally underrepresented groups that are missing at the top. And when we look at the startup world in specific, women are still highly underrepresented there too. So currently there are roughly 20% female founders. And when it comes to science and tech-based startups, the number of female founders is even lower at 10%. And the reasons for these disparities are very complex and they range from missing role models, socialization, structural hurdles, and of course, a lot of biases from all involved parties. And we could spend a whole day and night discussing uh, all the different reasons, but um, let's, let's talk about why we should even care about more diversity. Because um, yeah, why do we? And uh, diversity, uh, it, it's important for me, diversity not only in terms of gender, but really in terms of social, ethnic and educational backgrounds. So one of the reasons why we should care about diversity is diversity pays off, diverse team, score more higher on uh, collective intelligence and they bring in more new ideas and different approaches to solve problems which is as you all know is a key success factor not only in economic uh, academic um, environments but especially in the innovation and tech space the most successful data-driven companies have understood this and are hiring accordingly and so th that is already enough of a reason, but uh, there is also another reason. And I was glad to, to hear from Ryan uh, what he is uh, actually uh, working on. So the other reason is to become aware of biases. Diversity helps to actually reduce biases and make sure that with the new technologies, we don't magnify and perpetuate some inequalities and stereotypes and create products that actually cover the needs of everyone. 
And in addition to what Ryan said earlier uh, tonight, uh, I'd like to, to illustrate what this means with two additional examples. And so one are like uh, the crush test dummies, um, like so, um, like the fetal consequences uh, this lack of diversity has um, for some underrepresented groups can be exemplified by crush test dummies. And for decades, they have been constructed constructed based on the generic male body. But we women are not scaled down men. We have different um, different uh, muscle mass distribution. We have lower bone density and so on and so forth. And these differences are, are all crucial when it comes to injury rates uh, in car crashes. So when a woman, a woman is involved in a car crash, she is 47% more likely to be seriously insured and is seven percent more likely to die and this is all due with how the car is designed um, and for whom and only since recently the industry is actually working on female crush crash test test dummies so i'm pretty sure that if more women had been involved in the design of crash test dummies uh, the characteristics of female bodies would have been taken into account earlier and uh, another, another uh, to give you another example is also that um, comes from the biomedical research. So when researchers looked at the medi medical studies, um, they found that women were often underrepresented. So for many disease types, uh, the proportion of female participants didn't match the gender breakdown of, of real world patients. So in the extreme, historically, there have been medications for women that were only tested on men. <laughs> So the lessons to be learned here is, as we, as my AI colleagues always tell me, garbage in, garbage out. So as a designer of AI algorithms, he or she should first become aware of biases in the data. And one way to make sure to become more aware of these biases is to have all the stakeholders represented in the teams of engineers and designers. So in short, short to have a more diverse team. And how do companies or startups, in, in my case, ensure diverse teams? And there's certainly not an all, all one fits all approach, uh, but I'm happy to share um, a little bit about what small and big measures we took at, at Yokoi. Um, and as, as we took as a startup founders who aimed for a, for a diverse team from the very beginning. So to achieve that, we first ask ourselves many, many questions because in our view, recruitment really starts way before the interview itself. So we ask ourselves, how do we communicate on the different platform? Is it, is it an inclusive language that we use? Which images do we publish there? How is the job ad written? Does it use male or female specific wording or is it gender neutral? Moreover, it is very well known from studies that men apply when they meet 60% of the requirements, whereas women only tend to apply when they meet 90 to 100% of the requirements. So we also took that into account by, for example, just saying, hey, if you don't meet all the criteria, let's talk anyways. Uh, most often they were much more qualified um, that happened also. And we also thought about offer part-time work or remote work to really um, reflect also their, their, their life. And we ask ourselves, where do we actually place the ad? Because the sourcing is also very important. Do we just add the, the, the job ad to LinkedIn or do we go the extra mile and place it, for example, in special WhatsApp groups uh, dedicated for women? And then when it comes to the interview, we make sure to not only have the hiring manager, but always someone from other departments uh, involved and to make sure that along the process, they always have interaction with male and female co-workers. So these are just a few things we have put in place, but you're still learning. We are currently hiring a lot of people. So we are testing things out and making sure uh, to also ask candidates for feedback about the interview process. And if I have a lost world, then, then I would just recommend everyone to educate themselves uh, and become aware of your own bias biases because no one is immune against uh, biases. And there are incredible books and studies that have been written about all these topics. And it all starts with awareness. Yes, that's from my side. Thanks a lot uh, for, for giving this, this an important uh, focus and push. Um, as mentioned, we also deeply care about it. We, we also, for instance, started also using tools from, from WittyWorks and others that can also assist in, in, in the starting this dialogue. So, so thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Um, 
I would hand over now to Sasha Stocker from uh, the ETH Entrepreneur Club for the last uh, ecosystem and pause. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, I hope you guys can see my slide. My name is Sasha. I am the current ex uh, executive VP of the ETH Entrepreneur Club, and I'm also an electrical engineering student at ETH. So it is my pleasure to present our student club today and tell you a bit about, about our activities. We started about 10 years ago and we looked like this back when there were less kind of strict safety measures at ETH and we were allowed to put bouncy houses into the main hall. And about two years ago, we looked like this when we were still able to meet physically. So here you see 58 individuals and these 58 individuals are responsible to organize over 30 events a year and actively support 23 startups in our co-working space, the Rocket Hub. It is also um, a great achievement to note that we have generated 25 spin-offs out of our community. Our club's main mission is to empower the next generation of entrepreneurs. And in order to achieve this mission, we try to focus on three goals. First, we wanna inspire students to explore entrepreneurship. And rather than simply joining an already existing company, they, they should actively create one. So our main uh, inspire, inspiration event is the fuck of night where we create an evening of embracing failure. Now failure is an inevitable part of being an entrepreneur. And we organize local and international entrepreneurs who shatter the taboo of failure by talking about their own failed projects and how they learn from them. Secondly, we want to educate students by organizing various workshops with the help of experts where we teach students how to start their own journey. And last but not least, we also wanna accelerate students. For that, we, for example, organize the start of speed dating where we invite startups and students to meet on quick speed dates to see if there's job opportunities where they could join for an internship, co-founder position, and sometimes even thesis work. Now, one of our club's major operation was founded when the Swiss government came to us with a challenge. They asked us, how can we make entrepreneurship more visible in Switzerland? And we took that challenge quite literal and founded Incube. Now Incube consists of a design thinking program where we invite international students to tackle a challenge in a team of five that they have to solve. They eat, sleep, uh, they eat and sleep in these cubes and together go from a simple idea to a prototype within just five days. So from a first version, which was based only in Switzerland, we've had an amazing growth and have already organized cubes at MIT and Singapore. Another one of our projects is the JoinUp platform. JoinUp is one of Switzerland's uh, newest jobs platforms specifically targeted for startups. And we have seen a great interest and have already been able to sign up over 200 startups that present their jobs there and interact with roughly 2000 talents on the platform. Now here are some quick impressions of our co-working space, the Rocket Hub. Um, you can see we have office spaces. We also have a lot of meeting rooms, uh, chill out areas and maker space and the greatest productivity booster there is, which is free coffee. Now we're gonna start a new project this year actually for our 10 year anniversary, which is called Launch. Now Launch will be a project to where we wanna to bring together the entire ecosystem of entrepreneurship and give students an amazing experience to get to know all the organizations that are just waiting for them to come with a project that needs support. For us, entrepreneurship is more than just creating a company in order to make money, which is why Launch will also give room to tackle challenges that all of our society faces. So these will be challenges regarding sustainability. We've already heard it that we still have major issues with diversity and also ethical challenges. I want to leave you with our motto, which is something that we truly believe at the club, which is written here. We believe that if you can dream it, then you can also do it. So thank you, Alex, for giving a student club also the opportunity to present at, your, at the ETH uh, AI Center. Thank you very much, Sasha. So very, very impressive what you're accomplishing and very happy to, to help uh, wherever we can on, on, on that journey. Good. I would like to uh, come to the last part of, of our, our program today. And this is uh, around uh, a new uh, series that we wanna, wanna kick off, which, which is called AI plus X. 
So we truly believe that AI um, has an impact on, on all of the areas in our society. And uh, we also mentioned a number of programs to engage with entrepreneurship and industry. Uh, we wanna go a little bit further because we be believe that the impact is, is not just in the near term, but also a little bit further out in influencing that. And so uh, that's why I'm very excited that we are partnering with ETH Strategic Foresight Hub. And uh, I wanna invite Fiona very briefly uh, from, from that unit uh, to sh tell us a little bit on what she, she's doing and what she's setting up with, with this program together with us. Great, good evening everybody also from, from my side and from the side of the Strategic Foresight Hub at ETH Zurich. Uh, the hub is actually not that much older than the AI Center. It was established about a year ago within the office of the president of ETH Zurich. And our mission is basically to make sure that ETH, ETH remains future fit in the long term. And we're really focusing at the horizon of about 20 years. We are trying to help determining robust path of action um, in an increasingly complex, uncertain and volatile future environment. So one way how we do that, and please next slide, um, is in trying to facilitate future oriented reflections and uh, conversations, either in workshops or labs or other exchange sessions. And that's why we're also very excited about the collaboration with the AI Center. As we all know, AI has already and will continue to change and shape how we do research, how we live, how we work and so on. We would like to foster future oriented discussions and reflections that do not only talk about how AI is impacting um, different research fields, but also put this into context and ask or, or look at it, what does it mean in the bigger picture? And also look at what other factors are driving change and how does this all interplay with each other? Um, it's a pleasure to announce the AI Index series. Um, this series consists of spotlights, dialogues and labs. So the spotlights are um, short videos in which uh, AI faculty members will explore their current research and also reflect on the current implications and the future implications. We will have dialogues where we will build on the content of selected spotlights. This will be led by the Strategic Foresight Hub and is really to deep dive more into future implications of uh, progress in uh, or due to AI. It's important to us that this series is uh, collaborative and it's not about us sending out stuff. That's why we also have the labs. These are really deeper dives um, to exchange, discuss and connect with the, the AI Center faculty and uh, become part of the community. And we would like to invite you for these labs. Um, yeah, next slide, please. We would like to take you on a six month journey starting today with this kickoff. We will have um, along the way, we'll have, uh, we'll share spotlights and dialogues with you on um, this website, which is um, called plusx.ai. And roughly on a monthly basis, we'll have uh, the AI index labs for um, discussions and exchange. The first lab will take place in May, on May 12th, and it will be around uh, legal tech. The second one in June will be about uh, AI and sustainability. The next labs, the exact dates and uh, the exact topics will be published on the website. And also you can sign up there in advance. I think that's uh, everything. Um, we're looking forward to traveling to the summit with you. And with that, I give the word back to Alex. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, thanks a lot, Fiona. So it's very exciting. So, so I like the combination of, of reflections of, of talks, but also the, the hands-on component. So in lack of a, of a uh, uh, physical format uh, right now, I think the labs are an amazing opportunity to engage and collaborate on different topics. So we look forward to inviting a number of startups, industry partners, and researchers. This is the main group that we want to bring together. And yeah, we, we end basically this uh, first series 
in October. So this is uh, exactly also where we have one year of the ETH AI Center. And we also wanna, wanna uh, uh, do this with a, a flagship event. So this is what we call the AI plus X Summit. It's focused on the AI research and innovation community. Uh, we try it as a physical event. So there will be around uh, 600, 700 participants. And um, we, 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 of course, not doing this alone. As you have seen, we are very collaborative. So we, we're uh, collaborating with the ETH Entrepreneur Club who is hosting the, the launch event there. And we're basically partnering up uh, with them that we can uh, bring AI plus X uh, to you. And uh, it's in the same spirit that we presented before, interdisciplinary approach, connecting people, engaging with talents and uh, shaping the future together. And we would like to invite you to join us in, in shaping uh, a Swiss way of AI and to lead the way towards trustworthy, inclusive and accessible AI systems. With that, I wanna, I wanna close the presentation talk. Um, we have one more thing where you can join um, and that is the networking. And uh, it's also listed on our website on a YouTube streaming link. So under this link, you can join us in a little community. Viviana, maybe you can say a few words um, on, on how we set it up. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, we would really like to, to invite you to, to really join us. So um, uh, grab a drink, unfortunately, out of your own fridge <laughs> for the moment and uh, join us at the at the networking. Um, we have a Wonder Me room prepared. Um, the link is also on the website, um, as Alex said. And um, what happens is you click on the link, uh, use Google Chrome uh, because it works best there. Um, and you give a couple of infos, your name, your photo, uh, you enable camera and uh, microphone, and um, then you can move around the uh, room using the mouse. And you will also see other people with their little pictures there. Um, and as soon as you move close to them, um, you kind of go into a video conference and you can be in a conference with more than one person you can go uh, to speak with up to I think 15 people in, in one communication circle and uh, we also have prepared areas but you can also feel free to just roam around the room and um, meet with each other uh, randomly so yeah we're very much looking forward to to see you all there and we wish you a lot of fun and a lot of meaningful new um, connections so see you there. Thank you. Thank you, Hi, everyone. Thank you.